Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webcast from the Charleston Hub, Higher Education in the 21st Century View from Cambridge University Press. We'd like to thank our City Press. I'm really excited about the panel, um, the session that they've got put together today. But before I get started with that, um, I have just a few quick housekeeping announcements for all of us. Uh, again, welcome. I'm Leah Hines. I'm the executive director of the Charleston Library Conference. The session is being recorded and a link to the uh, session will be provided to all of our attendees uh, within a day after the session. It'll be emailed out to everyone. We are going to save our questions till the end and I'll go over instructions for how to submit your questions in just a moment. We'll have a panel uh, for Q&A at the very end. We also have a very short attendee evaluation at this close of the session to ask your feedback and suggestions for future speakers and topics. Um, this session is being held through Zoom. Uh, Zoom runs the world right now, but <laughs> if you're not familiar with the, um, the platform, there are some questions for setting up your audio when you join. If you're having some problems connecting, you can also get audio through your phone and you can send me questions. If you have any problems with that, I'll help walk you through it. At the bottom of your screen, there's three icons. There's one for raise your hand, but we're not gonna be using that one today. Um, the one I want you to pay attention to is right next to it is the Q&A button. And that's what we're going to use to submit questions for our panelists at the end. Uh, once you click that, a little box will pop up. You type in your questions, hit send, and we'll hold it until the end of the session when we do our Q&A at the end. Uh, again, the session title today is Higher Education in the 21st Century, The View from Cambridge University Press. We have three presenters, uh, Ben Den, who's Director of Publishing, Books, Cambridge University Press, UK. We also have Tristan Collier, Channel Marketing Director, Academic, Cambridge University Press, UK and Dave Morris, Digital Projects Editor, Cambridge University Press, UK. Um, we'll have a couple more people join us for the panel Q&A at the end. But for now, uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Ben, who's going to be our first presenter. Thank you very much and take it away, guys. Thank you, Leah. And uh, thanks to everybody for joining us today for this overview of our HE website and sales model. Um, I hope it'll be a, an, an interesting session. And, and as Leah said, you know, we'll, we'll have time for lots of questions at the end. Um, so jumping on to the, uh, to the next slide, Dave, if you can, uh, this is what we're going to cover. Um, I'm going to speak first about our vision for the HE, for our HE platform, uh, why Cambridge University Press have launched this now and how it fits with our overall vision. Um, and then Tris is going to talk a bit about the customer focus creation of the platform and the story of the period leading up to us launching the platform last year. And finally, Dave is going to talk about the is going to walk us through the platform itself, and that will be a will, will be a live demo of the platform. Um, so jumping on to the next slide, Dave, if you can. Okay, so this is this is the 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 the, the vision behind the platform, and I've put this statement at the top here in blue, because I think it's really important. You know, our vision was to have one joined up ecosystem for CUP textbooks, research books, and journals. Um, and so we really have launched this platform as a continuation of a strategy, which started a few years ago with Core. Many of you will be familiar with Core. Uh, for those of you who aren't, that's our online platform for all of our research books and journals. Um, the HE platform is distinct from Core in some of its features, but it really is an extension and continuation of that ethos, and it functions as part of the same ecosystem. Um, that joined up ecosystem is really, really important to us. And one of the key features of the platform will be a federated search tool, uh, which will allow students to search across core and HE at the same time. Uh, what this means, of course, is that depending on the, the, the um, packages from CUP that the institution has purchased, uh, those users will have seamless access to research books, to journals and textbooks, all within the same very clean interface and, and, and with a consistent user experience. Uh, there's some really fundamental principles that we use when we were creating the platform, uh, the four that I've listed here, um, uh, all of which will be familiar with you because these are our values that, 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 that we feel we share with our library partners. Um, the first one is around access. Uh, it's a simple concept for us. We quite simply want our books and everything that we publish to be accessed by as many people as possible, as easily as possible. 
Uh, the second is affordability. It's an extension of access. Uh, we need to work with partners to find models that are both sustainable and affordable um, because that in turn maximizes the, the, the access and the reach of our content. Um, the third is convenience. Uh, we want to create and constantly evolve an easy and intuitive student experience across our publishing. And that means that's one which suits our users. Um, and the fourth is visibility. We really want our publishing to be easily discoverable and easily available online. Um, and I've put in the yellow box here what this kind of adds up to, which is uh, uh, better student outcomes. And this is really important because I think this is a, you know, it's a shared mission for, 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 for publishers and libraries and indeed, of course, for academics and students. Um, it's kind of obvious when you look at it, but it's something that can get easily lost in all the noise around, around uh, the academy and academic publishing. So, Dave, if you can jump onto the next slide, please. Um, and uh, this is a really important question for this audience. Um, uh, why this model and why do we think you as librarians should be interested in textbooks traditionally have been purchased by students outside of the library? Um, so why now? Why digital textbooks? Uh, why a subscription model, which is what we're working, um, what we're offering? And why are we offering collections of textbooks? Um, uh, so the first point on this is, 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 is around choice. Um, this model maximizes choice for all of our important customers. It gives amazing flexibility over what you buy and the chance to revisit that later by avoiding a high perpetual access price. If you do choose a collection, it gives your customers, academics and students, incredible choice over what books they actually use. Um, and because the barrier to access is then so low, because the books are available by the, by the library, it gives academics freedom to teach from different textbooks uh, and to pick and choose the content they assign without fear of pushing up student fees or not getting buy-in. So it really offers incredible flexibility and a different way of thinking for academics um, who are not wed to just assigning one textbook because they, are, they, they, they need understandably to keep their, 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 their student fees low. Um, the second point, it brings some of our most used titles into library catalogues. You know, we're big fans of usage and I know that, that, that you all are too. Um, textbooks get some of the highest usage of any of our books. Uh, so it's, this is giving you access to our most used books, thereby increasing your usage as well. Um, it makes textbooks affordable by spreading the costs. Textbooks are very expensive to produce typically. They're some of the more complex books that we make. Uh, and subsequently, that often means that they're expensive to buy. Um, the idea of the subscription model is that we're spreading out costs, uh, both over time and across institutions. So it's a way for us to make the books much more affordable. Um, it gives that instant access to new and updated textbooks as they publish. And this is really important. Customers are buying with this model a, a subscription to the platform, but not the books themselves. Uh, the books are part of that subscription, of course, but the subscription is to the platform. Uh, that means that when new editions and new books publish, uh, you would have immediate access to them if you have a collection subscription, you know. Um, uh, it gives, by, by removing barriers to access, it gives great usage insights as well. We and you can see what content is being used. So that's something that you can use to inform budgeting decisions. Uh, it's something we want to use in our publishing and speaking as the director of, 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 of editorial books at Cambridge. Um, uh, I, I'm hoping that this usage can be used to highlight student pain points. We can use that to then help us to commission new books and revised editions for the platform that will really address some of those issues. Um, putting all of our books into one place allows us to create a great and consistent experience for students. Um, and uh, we will, um, Dave will be showcasing some of that later, but it, you know, it gives a consistent experience and a student focused platform. And most importantly, um, I think uh, for you, for this, for, for this audience, it puts libraries, our partners, right at the center of the academy, driving, aiding and facilitating not only the research outcomes, which you've historically played an absolutely crucial part in, but in the course-based learning process as well. So it adds that kind of extra, extra layer to, to what we can offer together. We move on to the, to the next slide. Um, and I want to talk just a little bit about our ecosystem here. Um, what I've done on this slide is I've divided it into some of the benefits that are offered by 
um, uh, small publishers, um, uh, many of our, of, our, of our university press uh, counterparts. Um, and then some of the benefits which are offered by larger um, and often commercial publishers. Um, so I'm going to talk through this a little bit. Um, I'm saying here, small boutique publishers. And what I mean by that is publishers that can offer a boutique service, so a very bespoke service for authors. And typically uh, that has been the, the, the purview of the smaller publishers that, 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 that publish fewer books every year um, and can really, uh, really afford to, 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 to make each product and, and the service that they put there very customized and very unique. Um, that's a real advantage for those boutique publishers. A commitment to affordability, university presses, you know, as we know, are, are not for profit, they're mission driven, so they can keep the prices of their, of, of their textbooks lower, and that's a real advantage as well. Um, those publishers often have a very, very high reputation in the academic community uh, for some of the points that I've mentioned already. And finally, this is not so much a, um, uh, a, uh, a bonus as just a feature, um, they are aiming at uh, where a lot of often the very large commercial publishers aim more at kind of 100 level introductory courses. Um, these smaller publishers uh, can offer, will often work with those kind of higher level, more niche, uh, more bespoke courses um, where the student numbers are slightly lower. Um, so those are the real advantages, I think, of, 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 of those kind of publishers. By contrast, the large textbook publishers have some great things to offer as well. Often they will have digital platforms. Uh, they will offer flexible sales models, including subscription models. They have advanced offerings for both print and digital, and those will come with lots and lots of different ancillaries and tools, test banks, assessment tools, uh, you know, presentational tools, all sorts of other things. Um, of course, these two camps are not completely distinct, but by and large, I think you know that that, that kind of outlines that that um, ecosystem. And I'm guessing you can probably guess what I'm going to say next. And if we jump onto the next slide. Um, uh, what we have really tried to do at CUP is to position ourselves in a place which offers really the best of both of these worlds. You know, we are giving a, a customised experience and a human experience to our authors and to our partners. Um, uh, we are um, at the same time coupling that with the digital platform that we've built. Uh, we can offer flexible sales models. Uh, strong offerings for both print and digital. Um, because of the nature of us as a publisher, we have our journals and our and supplementary reading for textbooks all in the same place. Um, so that, that, that's a huge feature. And then, you know, um, we have the, uh, we're developing the ancillaries and tools um, that often come with those kind of larger textbook publishers. Uh, but we also have the bespoke service that, we've, that I've talked about, that commitment to affordability, uh, you know, um, a reputation in the academic community that we're extremely proud of uh, and we're also targeting some of those levels of courses uh, that some of those larger publishers uh, might not go after. Uh, jumping on to the next slide. Um, this kind of picture that, that I've outlined this sort of positioning of us as, as offering the best of, of, of those two distinct worlds with, with, with distinct advantages um, goes a little bit further as well I think um, it fits more broadly with where, where we see our, our, our USP as a press that we're really positioning ourselves at the heart of the academy um, by offering the best of both research and HE publishing all in one place and that really is the rationale behind, um, behind launching the HE platform. Um, as I say, to kind of offer that choice to customers um, and, uh, and really as an extension of, of, of a strategy that began with Core a few years ago. Um, and with that, I will hand over to Tris, who's gonna talk a bit about the story building up to the launch. Over to you, Tris. Thank you, Ben. Hi, everyone. Yes, yeah, so as Ben mentioned, I'm going to talk about the launch of the platform, which uh, of the website, which occurred last year. Uh, Dave, we could go to the next slide, actually. Thank you. So uh, before we launched our new website, we did have a, uh, an e-textbook solution. Uh, we called it HTML textbooks on Cambridge Core. Um, this was a, a solution which was informed by quite a lot of customer research across the world. Um, it was HTML format only, so no PDF. 
Um, it was offered with unlimited concurrency. There were flexible lease options. There was limited functionality. So it was a read-only experience. There was no offline reading and there was no personalized features like annotation, bookmarking, etc. cetera. Um, and even though it had been informed by a lot of customer consultation, in the, um, in the event of launch and testing with the market, it wasn't hugely successful in terms of uptake. So Dave, could you go to the next one, please? So we had a plan. Um, we wanted to uh, launch something much better. Um, it actually was in development before January. I've been asked to point that out that we didn't miraculously pull it out of the hat in January last year. Um, but um, so we wanted to make it um, a new, fresh solution, replacing the HTML textbooks on Cambridge Core. There's a, an example book page there on the right. Um, we wanted to design and test this throughout 2020. And then we wanted to launch in December 2020. That was our time frame for, for this new offering. Uh, next slide, please, Dave. So this was because, you know, Cambridge Core is, a, is very carefully built with a lot of consultation, a lot of testing to be a, aimed at the research experience, to the, at the researcher. So obviously the needs of instructors and students are different and we needed the textbooks to, to be on a better solution for, for the needs of those audiences. Um, we obviously, I've already said that the HTML textbooks wasn't really doing what we wanted. Um, so we wanted the new textbook website to have new functionality that instructors and students would appreciate, would use and would, would be drawn to. And we wanted to make sure we tested this through lots of interaction with the customers. We wanted the supplementary material to be included and to be contextualized and supported by the site. Uh, and we wanted the site to be future-proof so that it would adapt as we, as we added new functionality or we might choose to go in different directions in the future. Okay, next one, please, Dave. But um, I think there was another one, Dave. Did we miss one? Uh, okay, that's fine. So then this happened. So I'm sure this is just one snapshot, which I'm sure you're very familiar with from your own experience. This is Cambridge UK. Um, this is this picture on the bottom left is of the outside of King's College in Cambridge. This street is normally full. Last March, it was completely empty. Uh, Cambridge is a city of about 100,000 people. It gets over 3 million visitors a year. So you can imagine that it's usually very, very busy in these, in these streets. Uh, the top right there is uh, the old schools, which is the heart of the university. Again, it's usually very busy there. And in the top is Stephen Toop, our vice chancellor, who is Canadian and is there modeling his mask last year to uh, set a good example to students. So this had a huge impact. I don't need to go into the details, but you know, we're all more than familiar with this. So Dave, can we go to the next one, please? So this obviously had a huge effect on you as well as on us. Um, everybody went home, everybody was working from home. We opened up free access. So we wanted to provide access to you guys as far as possible. And one of the, um, the collections which we chose to make freely available to institutions was the HTML textbooks on Cambridge Core. And that went live on the 25th of March. I was really centrally involved with this. It was a big effort, a lot of coordination between teams to make this work. We actually extended this free access as, as an event, event folded that email on the right, which is the starkness of that email, I think indicates the pressure that was occurring at the time. We just wanted to get a message out. We didn't want to spend too much time Finessing it, we wanted it to be clear communication. We extended the access in the end until June 29th. And we ended up with 3,416 institutions being given free access to textbooks and, and other collections between these dates. That was an enormous effort by our sales support teams. They had to set every one of those institutions up individually as fast as possible, a uh, huge amount of work. Um, and the effect of that was profound. We really noticed the impact of this 
you know, we saw it in the usage figures. We could see it in the traffic. Um, our, the usage of our HTML textbooks jumped from very low figures when we just had the customers using it that we had um, to really hundreds of thousands of visits um, from those institutions. Um, really significant impact. Okay, Dave, next one, please. So this made us think really carefully about what we were doing in 2020. And we took this really big decision to bring forward the launch that we planned by six months. So we were then aiming to do a soft launch on the 30th of June, a uh, full launch 21st of August, and then we would continue that launch period and roll out additional functionality towards the end of the calendar year. Uh, this soft launch was a, was a full on beta version in terms of the way it was presented. This is something that we'd actually been encouraged to do by libraries previously. They, we had feedback saying, why don't you experiment more? Why don't you come out with beta versions of things and test them with us? This was actually the first time we'd done that. In the past, we always launched in one big bang as we did with Cambridge Core. So this was a new experience, but obviously when you've got that accelerated time frame, it's, it's potentially helpful. Dave, we can go to the next one, please. And the model uh, was slightly different as well, more slightly more sophisticated. So again, we, we wanted to offer unlimited concurrent users to all of our textbooks. We wanted an annual lease with an anytime to start. Um, we can provide the access on a single title or a collection, whichever is you know, required. And we offer a flat fee for institutional access. So the, this, this model isn't based on the number of students accessing or the number of students on a course. This is a flat fee for the institution. Um, we can obviously match titles against a reading list or against an, an adoption. And we decided to offer reduced pricing for more than five titles. And there is a set of preset collections, which you can see in that green panel on the right. Uh, which are also available and they they have a reduced price per title uh, if a collection is chosen and bringing the eight the the textbooks onto this website obviously means that we've got both of our sales teams involved so we've got a textbook sales team we've got library sales teams they're working together with this website although and and you know customers can come in through either route but the leasing itself, the, the subscription negotiation obviously occurs by the library in the final event. Okay, Dave, can we go to the next one, please? So when we had the beta launch, which was a small number of titles relatively, and then the full launch 21st of August, as I said, we had some extra bits coming through at this point. So we wanted the instructors. Well, with these next few slides, what I'm trying to give you is a flavor of what it was like internally for us. So actually I'm using some of the same slides that I presented during these development stages. At this stage on 21st of August, we were adding the instructor. Um, the instructor could specify that they were an instructor and then that would mean they have given a different account area to what the student would be given. We were launching the bookmarking at this stage. We were enabling print options for up to 15% of a book by page extent. Uh, we were improving accessibility of the site and we had these two, um, off, these were the initial two offline reading apps, one for Windows, one for Google Android that we launched on the 21st of August. This probably worth mentioning this point that the site has the ability to, to log in as an individual. And when we launched on 21st of August, you had to do that to access the content. So the content was enabled and obviously the library system you would have your institutional login which gave the access but in a, in order for the student to access the content they had to create an account and log in and the reason for that was to enable all these personalized features like bookmarking annotation highlighting printing etc to be saved and able to be re-accessed afterwards that was a feature which although you know technically we had to do that to enable all that functionality that was a feature which was not popular with all of our library customers. So if we go to the next slide, Dave. Okay. So by, by December, um, we 
move to another phase really and and to demonstrate this this as we've said we were customer centric it's easy to say that you're customer centric obviously but as a as a hopefully as a demonstration of that because the libraries were feeding back to us you guys were saying we don't really want the student to have to log into the personal account in order to read the content because the you know the authentication is already provided by the library at this point so what we did is we we rapidly deployed a guest access. So this means that the student can come into the site and they can choose. They can either just go straight through and read the content without logging in again after they logged into their library's environment, um, or they can log into their individual account and use all those personalized features which are available. So you know, in a quite quick time, we managed to build this option. Uh, and satisfy that requirement from, from our customers. Um, the other updates that were coming through at this point is we were adding print-only textbooks, which um, was you know, very much wanted by our HE textbook sales team. We were looking that uh, we were gonna add 2020 and 2021 print-only textbooks. Um, we would also at this point be publishing all of our new textbooks onto the site, whether they were print only or print and online. At this point, we enabled this functionality to export the annotations that had been made so that they could be you know, sent out of the site on a PDF. We had more offline reading apps coming on board. So at this point, four apps, Windows, Mac, Google, Android, Droid, sorry, and iOS. Um, we had user biller, which is a, a feedback mechanism on the site so that we gather more, more input from everyone who was using it. We had full, te full text search working across the site at this point, um, not for some of the pages, but across the majority of the site. And also at this point, we had cut and paste, which was 15% by word count for each, each logged in user. Okay, Dave, can we go to the next one? So um, this hopefully gives you a flavor of what was happening live at the time. So this was a slide which I presented on the 11th of January, which was an update on what we launched. And we, you can see here, we had three things go live on the day. So we redesigned the book landing pages on the site that went live on the 11th of January. We had keywords on selected titles, which you could click on and go through to search pages. We had a system called unsilo enabled and Unsilo was is a um, relatedness application which uses AI to surface content which is related to the content you're looking at, and that works right across core, not just on HE. Um, actually, I'm just going to answer a question that came up about the print only. So, yes, it's an online collection. You can you purchase a, a collection of e textbooks. But this site enables much better functionality than we had previously. So the HE sales team requested that some print only titles came onto the site so that they could take advantage of that. Obviously those print only books are not able to be accessed online, but they give a, a, land, a good landing page for the, for the instructors and the students who want to, to find that book. So that was the thinking there, but you know, we're looking obviously in the future to make more and more books available online and not print only. We've also been at this stage conducting audits of the site for SEO and accessibility. So those were areas where we were building fixes and improving the site according to the outputs of those audits. Dave, next one, please. Going forward, uh, these are the, what we're looking at doing on an ongoing basis, so improving metrics that are displayed on the books landing pages. We implemented some of that now so you can see the number of hits on the on the um, landing page for the book and you can see our metric score. Uh, we want to improve the dashboards for the different different categories of user if you like. So the, um, the librarians and the instructors will see different things when they log in in future. We want to make digital inspection copies available via the site. They're not currently, and we want that to be implemented because obviously we want the 
the inspection copy to actually the examination copy to reflect what the student would be using when they when they look at their adopted textbook that is quite a complicated piece of um, development so it's an ongoing process that we're working on right now more imminent is access codes so the ability to provide a code which gives access for a limited period we're looking at digital e-commerce and print e-commerce to be developed on this on the site we want to display table of contents in advance of publication which helps everyone to know what's coming and whether they're thinking ahead about adoptions we want some analytics that we can provide to you and to the instructor about how students are interacting with the site we are working on the spec for that right now we want to have better integration with with the print catalog which is on kenews.org about print books we want some more back list loaded um, we're looking at that at the moment that's being talked about in the he and the library sales teams and we're using a system called recollective which is a market research system to consult with all the cohorts who use the site um, to inform us on what they want us to do what they want us to develop and feedback on current developments so still a lot to do um, and we're working quite in a concentrated way on these aspects right now at the moment dave next one please so this is some of the feedback we've received um, i won't go through all these but you can see here that our feedback has been pretty positive um, people have commented students have commented that the e-reader the, the content is, that the content is hosted in is easy to use um, that they, people find it clear um, that it's clean you know modern um, libraries have fed back that they like the functionality that the price point is at the right place for them and that they feel that the, the site is clear and well designed and, and intuitive to use and also that it that it works quickly that it's fast so you know i'm not saying we don't have more to do and that we can't make it better but so far we feel that it's gone quite well and we're definitely much happier with it than we were with our previous solution which was the html textbooks on Cambridge core so on, on that note i'm going to hand over to dave who will give us a, a demo of the site absolutely thanks tris bear with me just a moment please while i switch out my screen so there we are so hopefully now you can all see the website that we've spent uh the last half hour or so telling you a little bit about so this is it uh, and personally I'm a really big fan. I think one of the things you'll notice is that we've got a really similar look and feel to Cambridge Core. Uh, I'm always really aware that these are sibling platforms, they look and feel very very similar. The first thing uh, that you'll see here is our search bar which is nice and big so it's obvious where to go and start looking for content uh, and one of the things we've carried over from Core is this option to search for content that I have access to. So if say as a, an institution you take um, one of our subject collections, then anybody logging in from, from your website will find, or from, sorry, from your institution will find that uh, clicking that button, they can find just the books they have access to, which we think is really, really uh, important. Uh, up next, we've got this subject breakdown here so if you wanted you could go and uh, scroll through all the books we have available in say language and linguistics and you could have a look at that and you'd find them broken down uh, even further there by common course names uh, and again we just want to provide instructors and students lots of ways of finding content that's relevant to them so I think that's really helpful uh, and here we have new titles that are recently published and again you could you could take a look through those and if you looked on a subject page it would be more specific to those subjects those those new titles and then at the very bottom here we have some related resources so uh, Cambridge Elements if you're not familiar with it is our short form scholarly publishing program it turned two in January uh, we're, we're very proud of it and it has some content that's really relevant for uh, undergraduate and postgraduate teaching so we want to flag that here 
Uh, next up, we've got Cambridge Shakespeare, which is the complete works of Shakespeare available online. Uh, and each of those has the new Cambridge Shakespeare commentaries built into them. Uh, and some of them have the performing Shakespeare as well. So there's a real wealth of, Cam of Shakespeare resources from Cambridge available there. Uh, as you'll imagine, over, over the last year or so, we've been running a series of remote teaching webinars, and we just wanted to flag those here. Uh, and finally, another library product we have available is uh, Multimedia Fluid Mechanics Online from the ever evergreen, ever popular Homsi et al uh, authoring team, uh, which is, is available as well. And we just want to, to flag those up because we think they're really helpful resources for people teaching courses in, in certain areas. So what we'll do now without further ado is have a quick search and I will turn on this uh, search content I have access for just to show you how that will work. Uh, so at the moment, full disclosure, I'm at home. I'm not on press property, so I don't have any kind of IP recognition. And because I'm not logged in to uh, either Shibboleth Athens or a personal account, I don't actually have access to very much content at all. But we'll see what we can find anyway on water resources. Uh, and if I do that here, you'll see there's nothing available. Uh, but if I pull off this flag, there we go. There's a, a wealth of things available. Uh, but that just shows you how powerful that uh, content I have access. Uh, yeah, should only show content that I have access to is. Um, you'll see we also flag here in the refine options um, online and offline reading available which will cut out some options. Uh, and we also have that print only for books where we don't have digital distribution rights, um, but we want to make those available to instructors who might find them useful. So let's take a look at, uh, at this book here. <coughs> Excuse me. You'll see here at the top, we flag this as part of our e-collection. So that as a librarian, you know that this would be available for you to purchase. And if we click through on that, uh, you'll see here we have the various access options available um, and that just runs through the different collections and uh, gives you some of those details we were talking about earlier about our lease models. Coming down the page we've got obviously the blurb of the book available here uh, and a variety of information. The, the standard page here is just an overview of the key features and bibliographic data uh, and the aim here is just to make that available to instructors as best we can. The contents then pull through here is the next tab, which we know is really important for instructors while they're evaluating content, see if it's going to be relevant and also to you as librarians, uh, along with chats, DOIs and so on. We also make our resources available here, which is a huge improvement on that uh, textbooks on core solution Tris was talking about there, the resources were on a completely different web page to the book content. So if you were a, a student or an instructor and you were trying to find the relevant resources to a book, you had to go hunting and that was not a good user experience at all. So we'll just have a quick look in here. You'll see this book has some general resources available, uh, which I could download. Uh, there are also some really great student resources here that I can go and have a look at. And there's also some instructor resources. Now you'll see these have a padlock, so they are locked resources, but if you were to be an instructor, you could get in contact with this using this button here. Uh, and it will that will allow you access to those resources to use in your teaching. Uh, and one of the things that, while I'm biased, I really do love about Cambridge is that these resources available on our website are all free. So if you're a student, you don't have to pay any extra to get access to those. And if you're an instructor, using our book on a course, again, these are all available to you. There we go. We'll just pop back onto the book landing page now. Um, again, there's a tab about the authors, uh, some relevant reviews, and that metrics tab we were talking about earlier. And you'll see this was published relatively recently, so the page views have accumulated and we've had a few interactions on social media, which pulls up the altmetric score. The other thing I would love to show you is how I can add to bookmarks, but you'll see here, it just tells me that I need to log into a Cambridge Core account. Um, one of the joys of having a shared underlying platform is that Cambridge Core and the higher education website 
share a login and I will come back on to why that's a good thing shortly. Um, but certainly for us in terms of launching a new website, it just meant that we didn't have to develop a whole new login experience and account. Um, and again, I have two login options here. I could log in via Shibboleth or Athens. So if I were uh, one of your instructors or students at home, I would have that login option available. Um, but as I'm press employee, I obviously have uh, a Cambridge login here. And you'll see now I have the option, I have added this to my bookmarks because it knew I wanted to do that when I, I tried to log in. And I can also add this to my offline bookshelf, which would allow me to read it later offline. Uh, and we'll we'll go through a demo of that in just a moment. Um, so I've run you through a little bit of the site. What I will do here is just find us a, another book that we can have a look at. So if I search for climate change, uh, you'll see we have a pretty good list on climate change as well. And we'll just go into science and politics of global climate change. Um, and you'll see here, removed from offline bookshelf. So uh, at the risk of giving you a little spoiler of what's coming, I'll be able to show you this both online and what it looks like in the desktop reader. Uh, for obvious reasons, I won't disconnect from the Wi-Fi to show you how offline reading works in practice, but it's, it's absolutely the same use as that desktop app. So if I click this read online button, you'll see we dive straight into the content here. Um, and it's actually remembered, I was practicing this demo earlier, uh, and so it's remembered that I was in chapter three, it's just loading some maths there. We use um, something called MathJax to make sure that the math renders in a really um, accurate way. We, we know how important mathematics is. Certainly I do as a chemistry graduate, if, if anything goes squonky there, we're in trouble. So there we are, it's remembered I was in chapter three. And you'll see I can just navigate between chapters here using those side arrows. Um, and again, I, I really like this book. We've had some new online text designs created just to make the most of this new e-reader format. We really wanted to make sure that those books are engaging for students to read, but also highlight the study content that they need. Um, Another great feature is you see these blue words here are hover overs. Uh, so these are all actually in the book glossary, but rather than navigating from here to the glossary, we pull those definitions through so that students or instructors can just mouse over those and see what we've got going on. And, and then within chapter, it's just scrolling down. Again, you'll see here we've got different aspects of the text design pulled out. Um, and you could click on chapter three here and that would dive you across into, uh, into the chapter three, but I won't run around doing all of that right now. And again, figures display quite nicely. Um, and sometimes they will pop out, but of course, because I'm in a live demo, something has to go wrong. So we'll hope that's the only thing. One of the other features that we've, we've spoken about is that personalization and uh, the idea of students being able to use this as a study resource with textbooks on core. We found that uh, it was a very flat PDF, which didn't, uh, PDF, excuse me, a very flat HTML page, which didn't give a great user experience. But here I can select some text and you'll see I have the option to add a note, which I will do very quickly. There we are. Uh, and I can also highlight some text as well, if that's of interest and I have different color options. Uh, just briefly to speak about weblink and hyperlink. A weblink is an external URL. So if I had, say, um, a relevant news item I've been reading, I could link to that. And hyperlink just takes me elsewhere within the book to related content or content I, I think is related. Uh, so I can highlight that there. Uh, the other option, of course, was to copy. And just to give you a quick demo of that, I can confirm or cancel and the e-reader will track how much content I've copied and pasted. The, the final thing to show you is that I can just drop in a bookmark here. Oh, there we are. I absolutely can, as long as I remember how to do it. There we are. Uh, and that would allow me again to come back at a later date and pick up where I left off, or it's another way of just flagging relevant content. So I'm just going to click this sync button here. Uh, and you'll see it's just syncing up. And that means it's feeding through to my account uh, and we'll go and have a look at offline reading. 
So I will just switch my screen to Cambridge Spiral. So this is our offline bookshelf. Uh, and this allows us to read. It's available on Windows, Mac, iOS, and Android. So we have a wide range of options available. And if I click there, you'll see again, this just opens up uh, into chapter three, which is where I was last time I was reading this book. Again, it just goes through that rendering process. I'm just going to sync up to my account. So as long as you're connected to the internet, you can join everything up and you'll see that seamlessly my annotations here from chapter four have pulled through along with a, a few other ones I've made previously. But if I just click on this button here, it takes me exactly to where I was uh, and allows me to see that annotation in context. Again, demonst demonstrating this with a math heavy book is, uh, gives you an idea of some of the load times there, but it's, it's pretty quick, pretty seamless. And all of my annotations have carried through uh, and they go back and forth from here to the web account as well. So that's the real joy of having that additional login stage. Um, if students wish to do that, it's really, really helpful. Uh, now, just before I finish up, there's one more thing I would like to show you. So I will take us back to my web page. There we are. Uh, and I will just hop over into my account to show you a couple of bits here. Um, you'll see that we've got the option for uh, accessing your KBART listings, your mark records, and your usage reports through count to five. Now, unfortunately, I can't demonstrate those because I'm not a librarian. Uh, but if you click on that, you would find that actually you move across to Cambridge Core. Uh, and that means that you can download all of those reports uh, and stats and records for any textbooks and research content that you have access to. So as a librarian, you're not having to go to two different places to pull that usage data. You can do it all in one place, um, which is, is a real benefit. And the final thing just to show you here is this librarians tab, which has loads of useful information uh, and a Q&A or FAQ rather, just to help you to navigate uh, the site a little bit and answer any questions you might have. So that's everything I have to show you of the, the website and the e-reader now. Uh, I'll pop off my share. I think we're going into Q&A with you now. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful presentation. And now, as uh, Dave said, we are moving into our Q&A portion. Um, so Ben and Tristan and Dave will be joined by Sarah Forsyth, who is li library sales rep, and Conchetta Laspeda, who is a metadata librarian. So uh, we'll go ahead and jump right in to some of the questions that have been submitted already. Um, let's see here. The first one that I have is asking about a lease model in the sciences for physics and astronomy. Is there a separate? Um, yeah, I can just briefly talk about that. Um, we do sell uh, physics and astronomy as um, a distinct subject collection. Um, it's available for lease. Um, I checked our price list and there are about 60 titles in that collection at the moment. Um, and we'd be happy to get back to you with, uh, with more information and, and pricing if, if you're interested in that. Great, that's something that we can follow up with uh, the person who asked that question. Uh, up next, we have a question. Uh, in prep for our fall quarter 2021, we may receive CUP textbook requests over August and September. Do we have to submit these all together to get the bundle discount or perhaps submit singly as they arrive and still get the bundle discount upon reaching a threshold? That's for me too. Um, the answer is, the short answer is yes. Um, ideally, we would love to get the title list, just one title list at once, and then we can, you know, figure out the best pricing and get the correct discount um, for you. However, I know in my territory, I'm the rep uh, for Canada. We did have a case this fall where uh, a library needed to place leases ad hoc. Um, they were getting faculty requests sort of throughout this, this period of August and September. So we uh, I worked with them to track the titles um, that they were leasing. And once they got to five, I started to apply 
um, the discount. Um, so the more titles you order, the bigger the discount gets. So we would just work with you to, uh, to keep track of that. So it definitely is possible and uh, you can reach out to your sales rep or we'll get in touch with you um, with more information. Great, thank you. Uh, next question, how about the access options? Are they ready to be used now on the Cambridge website? Yes, I think the answer is yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, do tables and figures include citation information? I think that's one for Dave. Thanks, Chris. I had a feeling it would be. Um, so we we definitely encourage authors and make sure those are correctly cited where they're a third party um, image or table. So yeah, those are will be correctly cited within the book. Thank you. Um, are there plans for integrating the site with online courses? Uh, yes. I think that's me again, isn't it? So but you go ahead, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, thanks, Chris. Well, that, I mean, that is absolutely the answer. Yes. So um, we, we've got a couple of different online course programs running. Um, one of those is the Cambridge Advance online program running with uh, Cambridge University, which is looking to run a, a series of online courses through academics from Cambridge. Uh, and also as the press, we're looking at how we can provide online courses that uh, marry up with our textbooks to provide kind of a wider range of options for uh, instructors and institutions so that if they were looking to move to uh, online education through a course model, we'd be able to support that. Uh, and the goal for that is very much that um, this website becomes the home for our higher education content. So you'll find our textbooks and our courses there. And again, that's part of the reason that we're bringing through some of those print only books uh, that aren't available for institutional purchase because we want to make as much discoverable as possible. We have um, kind of three key users envisaged with this site. Uh, we've got librarians, instructors and students. And so we want to make sure that instructors and students can find other content that for whatever reason we can't make available as an ebook. Sorry about that. Leah, you're, <laughs> I you fell into the mute trap. <laughs> um, if here's the next one, if we're arranging to access three or four digital titles for course adoptions, why would we be interested in a collection of titles that wouldn't be used? Will I take that one? So I think I, I think that, yeah, I think the answer is that the that the the way we we've sort of tried to build the model is that. Once you're interested in adopting a, a, a certain number of, of, of titles, and we've tried to keep the, the, the you know the, the prices of those individual subscriptions sensible as well. But once you once you once we're fulfilling those kind of adoptions, um, you know we feel that there is great value in then giving 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 that institution access, for, you know, for for, for um, uh, to a much wider pool of content. Uh, which may or may not be used because at the moment we don't know how that content might be picked up by instructors when the barrier to access for that is so low. So it kind of comes back to the point that I made made before that, you know, historically um, instructors might have picked up and used one textbook um, because and 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 not been so free to pick and choose from other materials because uh, you know they want to keep the prices down for their students. But we think that that kind of behaviour might also change for the better. Um, uh, for, for, for a better outcome for everybody if instructors are freed up to pick other, other content that they might not have adopted previously. Great, thank you. Uh, here's another one that just came in. Um, do you have analytics on increased usage resulting from the free access provided during lockdown? Yes, so um, I believe we did supply usage on wrong request to institutions who are interested in obviously they can run their own usage on Cambridge core um, but we did talk to institutions about the increases that occurred during that free access period and in fact we did have quite a few conversations uh, between the sales team and the libraries around you know some libraries wanting to extend that access because it had been so helpful to them and so that's why Actually, we did end up 
making sales really early uh, when the beta phase came online to, in to institutions who wanted to just carry on. So, you know, obviously it couldn't be on the same level of content because we didn't have it all available on the beta site at that point. But yes, and we can provide help and support around that if you just contact your, your normal sales rep, um, I'm sure. Sarah would, is used to doing this for, for her customers, for example. Yeah, definitely. Great. Uh, looks like we've got time for at least one more. Um, why are your textbooks only available as subscriptions? We'd prefer perpetual access to these. Ben, I think this is something you covered in your intro. Do you want to speak to that? Uh, yeah, I can do. Yeah, so I think. Um, our view on the um, uh, um, on the on the, the idea with the subscription model really is to, as as, as I mentioned in in, in 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 what I was talking about, you know, textbooks are they're they're typically very complex and very expensive books to um, to produce, um, and the idea really of of of, of, of having a subscription model um, for these books is that. Um, is that the the you know it, it's a way it's a way of of of, of spreading those costs um, both over time um, and across um, uh, lots of different customers. You know we we hope that the that the the, the, the take up of this is going to be is going to be very good, um, and it creates a kind of sustainable model for 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 making those products affordable and crucially available to to students at the point where they need them. Great, thank you very much. Uh, are there any further questions from the audience? Last chance or forever hold your peace? <laughs> Just kidding. You can follow up by email with any questions that we have after this. But um, uh, if there are no further questions, I would really, really like to thank Cambridge University Press for sponsoring this session and thank all of our panelists um, for this wonderful presentation. Um, and I would like to remind all of our attendees um, to answer the quick uh, attendee evaluation that's gonna come up after the close of the session and just give us some quick feedback, um, what we did well, what we can improve on, and maybe some suggestions for future topics or speakers. We'd really appreciate that. We value your feedback. Um, thanks again to everyone. Uh, any final words in closing, gang? Leah, just to say thank you. Thank you for being such a great host and for putting this on and, and thanks to everybody for, for listening. We hope it was we hope it was useful. Great. Thanks. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. We'll see you back on our next Charleston conference webcast. Bye everyone. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.